The brothers wish. The brothers wish, brothers wish. The brothers wish. The brothers. You're West. now listening to Greg, it's the Brothers Wisp. Let's take hey a everybody, ride this is so Greg with the Brothers the Wisp, number 99, across the line. Let's uh, say hi to all our folks out and about. We've got Mikey from Chicagoland. Hey, how's it going? We've got Thomas Kiernak from Slovakia. Hello, everyone. And again, you got me from Texas. Boring old Texas. Uh, let's jump right in. We have a new patron this week. It's Carlin Ray. And I love, again, another uh, solid patron. Guy jumps in and is immediately firing from the hip. All kinds of good stuff coming out of this dude. He's like, um, I'm not sure where he is. No, I do know where he is. He's like in uh, Washington State, I think. And uh, he's like an ex-sprinkler guy. And uh, so he brings a lot of different disciplines into uh, the slack. He's uh, he's a bit of an electronic hacker. It looks like he's kind of piecing stuff together into random enclosures. It's pretty cool. And if you want to become a patron, you go to patreon.com forward slash the brothers wisp. Throw us a couple of bones and you get access to our patron only slack, which is where all the good stuff is. That's where you get direct access to people like Mikey. So if you want to get into a flame war, you can. Or uh, Thomas, <laughs> so that you can get... Uh, uh, overburdened with information about how you're doing things wrong and you could do it better. Now you've just made everyone scared of me. <laughs> Maybe they should be. Do you ever think well, of that? It's, uh, well, I mean, you know, um, your something's better than a flame war with me. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, everybody Thanks. likes to get to a fight they know they can win, Mikey, so, you know. Uh, Greg's just giving us all kinds of positive PR today. <laughs> I'm your guys' uh, biggest cheerleader. There you go. <laughs> all right. So uh, first things first, Nick Arellano got married uh, on Thursday. So you guys that know him, drop him a line. Say uh, congratulations, all that good stuff. And those that have had bad experiences, give him your uh, words of warning, I guess, if that's a thing for people. Monumental, monumental. Sooner or later, we're going to hear the same from Thomas. One day. One day. Uh, let's see. I got a quote of the week, which I, which I liked. Um, John Osmond said, he doesn't pay me enough to shut up, which I thought was really fun <laughs> way of looking at something. <laughs> he was giving his opinion to somebody who he was doing work for, and uh, he's not paying me enough to shut up. So that's... <laughs> I'm curious. It's like how much how much does someone have to pay you for you to shut up? I guess uh, I guess I kind of shut up at my uh, at my hashtag day jobs. <laughs> I guess maybe they pay me to be quiet. I don't know. You guys certainly don't pay me enough to shut up though. I thought that was pretty brilliant. It, it uh, I should probably get my uh, payments then. Oh, for sure. Let's see. Uh, Slack. I asked the Slack what you guys like for four port. SFP plus interfaces just for a server, not necessarily MicroTik related, but I guess it would work well with a MicroTik as well. Um, but you guys said the Intel, what is it, X710-DA4 was a good one. And uh, uh, my guy that's building up a server has purchased one, and I guess we'll give it a go and see how it do. I'm sure most of these, I mean, most Intel NICs are pretty much the same nowadays, right? Like the SFP plus ones. You guys have any experience with that? It, uh, I haven't used the 710, but I've used quite a few of the, the 510 or 520s uh, to dual port, uh, and they work. Uh, one annoying thing is that I think, uh, I think they have uh, an uh, Intel SFP lock, so you have to make sure that you get your optics coded for Intel or okay. use DAX. Gotcha. Yeah, I uh, I recommended that he get the branded or not the not necessarily branded, but the um, coded Intel uh, SFPs just to make sure. And like if you're shopping it, I mean a lot of people pick up their their kit off of Amazon or if you're going to a fiber store. I mean it's the same same nick as everything else, just coded a little bit differently, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which I still don't understand the vendor lock-in when it's so easy for people to buy third-party nicks that are coded for anything else. Why, why bother? It's the certification, right? If you want to be 100% official and on all of the hardware compatibility lists and you have to have that official certification and support, then you just have to shell out the money. 
Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, I guess that makes sense, right? I mean, that's like Apple's approach, right? To their ecosystem. It's like, we make all of the hardware. You have to buy all of our stuff if you want it to be technically covered. And I mean, it totally makes sense, right? So it's a, it's a known quantity. Screw everybody. <laughs> I, I'm, trying, I'm looking for silver linings here. I, I can understand why they do it. Not just make a lot more money, uh, which, uh, you know, is another rationale for doing to, such things. Uh, to make fanboys feel better about themselves? I don't know. I don't know. I like how I look with a Microtech. I don't think I've ever actually put a Microtech optic in a Microtech. I always use the Cisco coded stuff, and it works just fine. Uh, let's see. Thomas, somebody was asking about, I think it was Jeremy in Perth was asking about, he's going to be doing some broadband test projects, so he's got to put some nodes out there. I guess that's a governmental regulation is what he was saying. Um, you have to be able to prove your speeds, and so he wanted to have a small device that could do up to a gig. And I think, Thomas, you recommended the Pi 4s, right? Mm-hmm. Have you done such projects? I think um, Justin Miller was talking about using Pi 4s with NetXMS to actually do bandwidth tests and graph them, right? So I've done uh, quite a few things in the past on this front, uh, both in performance testing of various equipment as well as actual like production deploy of speed test nodes around large networks. And this used to be really hard before the Pi 4, uh, because Pi 2 and Pi 3, uh, sadly, they, they had gigabit NICs, but they were connected over USB 2 interface. So really, from a Pi 2 or a Pi 3, the best you could get is about 200 MEX hmm. uh, due to the USB 2 Ethernet interface. Uh, so up to those 200 MEX, Pi 2 and Pi 3 were great for like these little, you know, out in the wild deployments and like multiple nodes around the network where you have where you do speed testing from various sources to various destinations. But when you need more than that in the past, that used to be hard because there was really no like small little SBC single board computer device. Talking about like five years ago, this was before even the Intel Knox. Uh, came around, right? Nux, uh, the NUCs. Uh, so before those, uh, it was hard. And when the Nux came out, uh, those are still quite expensive if you need, like, you know, 50 of them to be scattered around the network in various conditions where they break due to temperature or, you know, just get, you know, destroyed by environment. But now with the Pi 4, it's an amazing little device that can easily do a gigabit uh, over iPerf. Uh, and the CPU is powerful enough, the Ethernet is actually in a PCI Express bus, so it will do full native gigabit, and it's just like, it simplified projects like these so much, it's, uh, yeah, I definitely recommend it for anybody looking for little fully functional Linux nodes to scatter around various places and do various things like performance monitoring with, it's, it's a great tool. I can't really remember, what is a Pi 4 retail for? Uh, it depends. There are multiple versions. There is uh, one, two, and uh, four gig uh, RAM version, uh, and the cheapest one, the one gig RAM, is thirty-five bucks. Uh, not bad at all. Of course, you have to get a cooler for it because the Pi Four runs a little bit hot, so you have to get the heatsink. Uh, you need some case. You need some power supply, but and then an SD card to to run it off. Uh, but I mean, altogether, it's like. 60, 65 bucks. Yeah, that's not bad at all. Especially if you've got um, governmental regulations and stuff like that. You know what popped in my head was I was thinking about this. If you were, say you're a WISP and you've got these scattered throughout your networks and you want to do periodic tests, I remember he was saying that, you know, they can't just do a test at 3 a.m. They actually have to do it, you know, like at peak time so they can give real reporting of what throughput could theoretically look like at uh, a peak time for them, which... I think is brilliant, right? Truth in advertising sort of thing there. Um, but I was thinking, say you're you're running it on a network that's already got a decent bit of traffic and you run this thing and you saturate the link. I mean, that seems like a bad idea, right? So if you completely saturate one of your backhauls, you're going to start getting packet loss. 
So, so I, it's this kind of tricky. adds a lot of complexity, right? Because now you have to do QoS even on, on link layer, right? For this to not affect uh, your customers. So likely what you would do in this case, you would set up QoS uh, properly and basically give the test the lowest priority possible so you would just use it to saturate the, the link but not to affect other traffic and then you would measure actually the link itself rather than what the speed test is showing you to be able to see full capacity of the link but then again who knows what the regulations you know are requiring right because if the regulations are requiring to show you like single uh, TCP stream throughput at a given time, then you will want that single TCP throughput to be the highest, which means it will affect other customers. Also, you know, is there some mandatory testing software that you have to use that's out of your control? Maybe I, you know, yeah. th this is a complicated topic with many variables. Yeah. So just thinking about it too, uh, like it seems like there's two options. One is just to see from this node back to, I guess, wherever I'm testing from. Um, what's the maximum throughput I could get, right? So totally saturate the link. Or uh, conversely, you could say, all right, I'm going to set the theoretical maximum for this Pi 4 to be what my highest user package is, right? So say I've got, you know, 75 megabits is my highest user package. Well, I will only allow it to go up to that, right? So that you're simulating a customer experience. So technically it wouldn't um, saturate your entire backhaul. And so, you know, I, I guess that would be a Hopefully. little bit truer test, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, one more customer on the network doesn't completely saturate the link, right? So, so that would be, um, I guess, more emulating the customer experience. So maybe that's what they have to do. I don't know. He didn't really give details on that, or if he did, I didn't read it close enough. But it seems like that would actually be for some kind of compliance thing, a good reason. But it seems like a lot of Wisps would want to know, um, you know, what's the every, you know, periodically, what's the theoretical maximum throughput I can get across a backhaul you know uh, at least for capacity planning you know like how many customers can i hang off of uh xyz tower you know how much how much bandwidth can my links really support across this not just what's on the um what's on the box that my radio came in but what what can i actually get through this link so when i was doing this in the past it was always at the time where it would influence customers the least so this would be automated. One project I did was automated nine, nightly uh, performance testing across the network. But this was, you know, at, at really, I think it was like at 3.30 a.m. Yeah. Because, you know, from their graphs, that was the least utilized time of the network. And yeah, it would just run for, I think we were doing 30 second bursts uh, across the network, collecting the results and reporting, graphing them. This was all using iPerf, Raspberries, and NetXMS, of course. So all the results were aggregated into NetXMS and graphed in NetXMS and then there were dashboards and reports made out of this, of course, also in NetXMS. But this is very different from, yeah, doing it during prime time, you know, that's, that's a very different consideration. Yeah. seems like in prime time you wouldn't want to try and test your entire link. Maybe the individual customer experience would be kind of the way to go with that. <laughs> I mean, that can yeah. be hard as well, right? Because if you have some business customers, which usually for business customers, you will have very different links than for residential customers, right? Yeah. And even it's quite usual, right, to have like one-off business customers that have super high speeds compared to others. So uh, I, I think it, a lot of this depends on what the regulatory body requires of you, you know, because if you, if you have that one customer, which is a 200 megabit link, which is on a dedicated point-to-point, -point, you know, wireless uh, connection. And how do you test if that one is performing as it should? If you should be testing, you know, during prime time and the customer is actually utilizing that link and that link is at capacity because it's a link dedicated to that customer, then, you know. Hmm, for sure. A, a, lot of, yeah. uh, a lot of variables, a lot of moving pieces there. <laughs> Yet, uh, um, so I was just looking at what the FCC requires for CAF2 phase two projects, which are just being built now. Um, 
for and let me see, uh, for latency, we require a minimum of one discrete test per minute for each of the testing hours. And I forget where they defined the testing hours, but I believe it was in you know in you know, focused on prime time gotcha. usage. Well, latency is um, an easy test. Yeah. And then, it's, it's your, and then uh, for speed, we require a minimum of one download test and one upload test uh, per testing hour at each subscriber test location. So from each tower, I guess. No, each subscriber. So each subscriber, you need to do a speed test once an hour. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, that's a lot of it. Moving honestly, pieces. I would say. That that's even stupid. <laughs> it um, well um, you know they've had a lot of people that take government money for you know building on a project and then say oh yeah yeah it you know it performs yeah. you know you know it's a hundred meg service and there's nothing to verify it <laughs> or the, uh, um like and the test locations are off net. Because people will, well, yeah, you know, you can get 100 megs to the test server on my network. Right. But, you know, but I have bad peering. Or I've got, you know, I don't have big enough pipe to the world. You know, I only have a 200 meg connection and I'm selling 100 meg internet. You know. You know, I get where they're just, you know, trying to cut down on people doing fraud. And, and really, you know, if you're getting a whole big pile of government money. There's no reason no, why mean, you can't. I'm, I am not saying you know don't <laughs> verify if people are doing the right things, but like this is mathematical. You can verify, you know, an average customer uses this much bandwidth, this many percent of the time, and I have you know this much available throughput on my uplinks and blah blah blah. You know this should come from mathematics, from submitting statistics about your client base, the packages you are selling, and your upstream connections. Right, you can easily calculate all of this mathematically. Uh, of course, that's just theory. So you should still do testing. Yeah, sure, one hundred percent. But I don't think it should be like once an hour. You know, uh, do a ridiculous amount of data, like you know, fifty max. Which realistically, if you are providing a hundred megabit connection, fifty megabytes is barely enough to ramp up the TCP window. To actually test if that speed is is good enough, and now you know if you do the math on this, like okay, I need 100 megabytes of data transferred to test a 100 megabit connection. That's eight seconds, right? As I said, barely enough to to ramp up the TCP window. So if I have 1,000 customers and I'm testing each customer once an hour and yeah. going off that with this, you know how much just useless data and load am I putting on my network? It doesn't make sense in that way at all. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah you're uh, doing you're doing what like twelve customers every minute, something like that, with a thousand. Yeah, and uh, let's just say hundred max, right? So that's what one point two gigs every minute. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that I mean, you're yeah, that would just be especially if it actually has to go through your upstreams through your peers. That's just I mean yeah. That kind of throws 95th percentile billing out the window because your circuits are constantly getting jammed. So, that yeah, like, like I said before, like this is th it's really stupid. <laughs> it, uh, I believe so. Then, this for this FCC testing, um, it's being done via Sam Knows, and I believe Sam Sam Knows does have a uh, a um. Uh, relationship with Cloudflare. Um, it's not. Ex it doesn't appear to be exclusive. You know, I was working on trying to get them, uh, you know, to do stuff at our IXs. But you know, in, in terms of your ninety fifth percentile, um, you know, you just connect to an exchange where Cloudflare is, assuming that that's you know an approved test location, and you know. Way you go, you know. You don't have to worry about ninety-five percent dollar because transport and IXs are rarely priced that way. Transit yeah, is for sure. S still, is it realistic results then? If you are dedicating a link and and choosing preferential pathing for the tests. Well, so I. Well, I mean, 
I believe it would be on an exchange. So then if you're on an exchange, you're there, you, you know, you would also have then, you know, good, uh, good capacity to Google and Akamai and Netflix and, you know, Amazon and so on and so on and so on. And, you know, I mean, you know, obviously they can't guarantee good performance to everywhere, but I think what, I think their intention is, you know, where is the bulk of the consumer traffic going, you know, to these, you know, big content sources. And then, uh... Yeah, but still, we've just calculated that for a thousand customers, it's 1.2 gigs of traffic, pretty much constant. That's that's ridiculous. <laughs> it, uh... Yeah. yeah, it doesn't well, seem super sustainable as you grow, yeah. right? Say, you're, it, uh, say your number gets up to 10,000 subscribers... That's gonna get hairy pretty quick. It, uh, uh, but now, now all that said, there could be more things in here that I have, because I, I just pulled up the document as we were talking about it, and it is a thirty-eight page PDF. Um, how fun! So there's, there's a lot of stuff in there, and we very well could be missing big piles of stuff. All right. <clears throat> well, if anybody's got any information, I'm sure they will share it with us. Uh, share us, share their thoughts, their wisdom. Let's uh, let's keep boogieing on down. So something that I saw in the Slack roll by was thrift. Somebody had asked about in a microtick disabling the route cache, and uh, thrift says it causes more problems than it solves. He also said that version seven has no route cache in the kernel. So I'm not 100 percent sure why somebody would want to disable the route cache. I think the route cache is like the fib, right? As opposed to the routing table. So you take the routing table, you compile it, put it into the fib for faster lookups. So what if you make a change in the rib and it's not propagating quick enough to the route cache? Is that why you would want to disable it in a micro So I think this is a little bit different. Than I am not 100% sure off top of my head, but I think how route cache works is that every time there is a routing decision, so there is a lookup in the actual routing table, it is cached based on the source destination uh, hash. So the source and the destination are hashed, the uh, outgoing interface is looked up in the routing table, and that is cached. This, for example, what this does is when you have ECMP, equal cost multi multipaths, it guarantees that a single source destination pair will always take the same route out of the ECMP. You know, Microtik doesn't do per packet load balancing on ECMP. <coughs> it's on a per source destination pair. And this is what the route cache does, right? It fills up, the more communication goes to the router, the more source destination pairs get hashed, and the routing decision gets, gets cached. Uh -huh. This is what the ca routing cache is. So, disabling that, you would force a lookup to the routing table for every single packet. Whereas, if you keep it enabled, you just hash source destination, lookup in memory, you know, in that hash. It's a much simple because now you are just looking up uh, data in, in a map, you know, key value pair in, in hashes. And uh, that's much faster than, than going to the entire routing table and looking up you know, in a routing table, potentially, if you've got full BGP peer, you know, half a million or 600k routes. Hmm. Can you imagine a situation where you'd want to disable it? I have never had to, and I don't know any use cases where you want, want that. So okay. For yeah. me personally, no. Whoever it was that was talking about it, I don't think elaborated on why they wanted to do that. It was just, it was just very curious to me that somebody was talking about disabling so I thought I'd bring it up and see uh, I'm sure there's some crazy use case maybe not crazy but maybe there's some edge use case where it makes sense I just don't know what it is mm. so speaking of micro ticks last week but, um, uh, real quick uh, I found a, uh, I was going through that, that PDF more and so it looks like it's not as crazy as we thought the number of test locations that they require I was mistaken mm -hmm. it is between 5 and 50 
grant supported locations per service tier per state. So if you yeah, had, you know, a 100 meg tier and a gig tier in one state, you know, between 10 and 100 customers, depending on how big you were. But it's about, you know, but it's focused on about 10%. No, that's not bad. Yeah, that's much more reasonable. Yeah, that seems scalable. So, um, let's see, catch it back up. There's a customer that owns a fiber network and they're doing um, switching instead of like optical muxing on this fiber network, which is fine. They're using some really expensive kit and I stuck a micro tick on there to be the interface for their management network to the rest of the world. And I got a call from them saying, hey, two days ago, uh, the router locked up for some reason and we had to reboot it and it got, got going again. And then uh, yesterday it locked up and we rebooted it and it doesn't seem to be working anymore. Can you go take a look at it? So I went up there uh, late in the day, which is okay, because I stopped by the Mexican bakery that's near the data center, and I picked up some empanadas and some tacos. Man, they are like the filthiest tacos. It's so delicious. Anyway, <laughs> I digress. So I got in there, and I plugged in the MicroTik, and I was trying to do uh, Mac Telnet to it, and it just it wasn't showing up at all. I switched ports, and I could actually see it, but it wouldn't let me connect. So I had pre-configured a replacement, so I just slapped it in there. It was like a, uh, a half AC squared. So I slapped that in there, turned it on, plugged my laptop in, exact same thing. I was like, what the hell's going on? So I unplug all the ports, and it works just fine. I'm in it. Um, then I plug in the server's ports. You know, they had a server in there for management. Works just fine. I plug in the... Uh, kind of the WAN port, it's got two trunk ports, one to their management subnet, uh, one, you know, it's like a VLAN to their management subnet, and then uh, one that's their internet connection uh, coming on over another VLAN. And the instant I plug that in, I lose all access to the mic. I unplug that port, it comes back. So I just left it in for about five minutes, and then uh, unplugged it, connected back in, and sure enough, the MicroTix told me that there was excessive broadcast multicast traffic, probably a loop. So I thought that was pretty killer. It was obviously overwhelming because, I mean, what is it? Um, it's got like four processors on that thing, or right, or like dual hyper-threaded or something like that. So, and it's like 750 megahertz. So it's a decent little little router. Um, and it was obviously overloading all the CPUs, which is why I couldn't connect to it. I mean, it wouldn't even hand me an IP via DHCP while it was doing this thing. Um, but it's still... As soon as I, you know, killed the port that actually had the loop on it, uh, you know, it was still up and available, and I could look at the log, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, it seems like in the past, like in the long, long ago with MicroTik stuff, they would just crash, you know, when, when a situation like this would arise, and I guess there's some protection mechanisms in them now. So I know, like, too, if you BGP peer with a MicroTik, and uh, it's got some kind of... Um, percentage of RAM that it that it must maintain so the route table will load up to a point till it hits that you know uh, small amount of RAM left over and then it'll just stop loading so that I guess the the router doesn't completely tip over and I guess they're doing some um, throttling on the CPU as well so that it just doesn't completely crash which I think is awesome so it at least gave me some insight even though it was a lower powered microtech and it couldn't withstand uh, the flavor of that magnitude it uh, it still was there enough to show me some stuff in the logs, and then I could turn that over to the customer because I didn't manage the the rest of their network, just kind of a little bit there at the edge, and uh, they were able to turn on Spanning Tree and uh, rectify the issue, which was really nice. I just thought that was I thought that was awesome, right? It was unresponsive. I couldn't actually connect to it, but it didn't completely die. So I thought that was pretty baller. That um does. Does Microtik have hardware-based uh, broadcast multicast mitigation? You know, storm control? I think, what, like... Uh, the CRSs have um, okay. uh, storm control. I know that. They do that in hardware. So, like, the CRS 300s have hardware storm control. Um, I don't guess anything I assume, else can. Because I would assume that would 
mitigate that issue if in hardware it was you know limiting that to a reasonable rate that then the OS wouldn't have an issue with it I assume yeah I'm trying to think I don't I don't guess you could do that with anything else because it's not going to do it in hardware so it's just going to all do it in CPU or attempt to and it was just too many packets coming at the board to to be able to do anything so yeah I think you could handle it this theoretically through bridge filters as well right uh, if bridge filters dropped like uh, you know you can allow a certain packet rate through a filter so you could do a bridge filter and I don't mean use IP firewall for a bridge I just mean a bridge filter right. and you could limit the packet rate based on the broadcast packet address to a certain point Maybe. Uh, of course, it depends on what was actually loading the CPU up so much. If it was forwarding of those uh, of those broadcast frames, or if it was actually some logic, you know, uh, on a higher layer, like uh, actual application logic inside of the Mikrotik that had to process those packets, and then it was dying because of that. So uh, it depends. But maybe bridge filters uh, with with packet uh, rate filtering could protect you from that but it just depends hmm. but the simple answer is put on some layer 2 loop protection and uh, not have to worry about this sort of thing yeah it seems like this is a second podcast in a row where we have to tell people to use STP <laughs> yeah because this really I mean this thing was really just acting as a router on those VLAN interfaces and it was just getting so many packets per second it just couldn't handle it it was pretty bananas. So Thomas, somebody was asking about fiber store switches and whenever you're asking about a variety of hardware, you have so much experience with so many vendors at this point due to Unimus, the amazing Unimus.net product that you sell, um, that you had the inside of every, pretty much every switch that fiber store sells has a different firmware different CLI interface, different syntax used for different commands. So um, I guess no configuration consistency. Yeah, and it's not just that. Uh, some of the switches that Fiberstar sells are marketed as GCOM. So if you do like show version, it will tell you GCOM switch and then the model. Some are marketed and, and in show version, they show you Fiberstar, but they are completely different CLIs. Uh, there is documentation is completely else, uh, completely different for every single model family. Uh, there is just no consistency, and you can re really see that they are just cheap OEM switches with OEM provided software that FiberStore is really just reselling. They are not developing any of those uh, NOS right. network operating systems running on those switches. Right? They they receive a reference uh, OS. And they just sell it with the reference OS. Gotcha. It's a uh, it um and apparently not even modifying the reference OS to include their name all the time. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I mean, for Unimus, right? We support quite a few of those fiber store switch lines, but it's like any time we receive a ticket of you know a fiber store switch is not working, I just forward it directly to a developer with a new driver fiber store and model <laughs> because I know right away it's just it's not that it doesn't work it's just that the syntax and the CLI is so different on every single one and the documentation is different and everything else and, but I mean you get what you pay for right so gotcha I wonder if there is a reason why all of these fiber store switches are so cheap well I think a, at least a chunk of those fiber store switches are designed so that you can load in another operating system on them right yeah, quite, uh, some of them, right? Right, not all of them. Uh, some of them are white box-ish switches. I don't want to say they are white box switches because that's, you know, a different thing. But some of them are open enough in a way that, yeah, you can load various different reference OSs. And, I mean, in the end, just like any other switch, they use the same chipsets, right? They use the same ASICs. So uh, it's not that, you know... There is not a thousand different switch chips and ASICs you can use in the world today. There is honestly just a few manufacturers uh, manufacturing a few different switch lines, which all the Linux drivers are the same for, I mean, within, of course, the, the, the ASIC and the switch lines. Yeah. So. 
Have you guys put in a Unimus driver for Cumulus? Yes. Gotcha. Have you run into it a lot? Uh, actually, we had support for Cumulus 2 just about from beginning of Unimus, and then some customers ask even for Cumulus 3, so we have support for 2 and 3 because they have a bit of a different way of interacting with them. Uh, so yeah, it actually came from customer requests. Very nice. And Cumulus is um, a network operating system, the kind that you can load on, say, some of these fiber store switches. Not all of them, but some of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, basically just a Linux OS tailored or, you know, packaged for networking operations, right? Uh, so you get packages pre-installed there for, for most of your normal OS uh, or NOS, you know, network operating system required things. And, but yeah, it's just a Linux system like any other. Very nice. I've never touched it, but I assume it's probably got some market share due to the white box stuff that's starting to become more and more available. Also, it's support, right? When it's a Linux network operating system, but it actually comes with training support and documentation directly from Cumulus, and that's usually a big, big reason why people buy it. Nice, nice, nice. So let's see, Carl. Uh, go ahead. I say it uh, as a as a tangent off of the uh, off of the uh, Cumulus comment. Have either of you looked at this Arcus company? Um, I think I posted it in Slack, maybe. Um, it's something that I saw from uh, Kevin Myers posted. I think it was on Facebook, maybe. Um, it, it it runs on uh, on uh, Oni uh, white box switches. Uh, they built everything from the ground up, and um, they support separating the control plane from the forwarding plane such that you run the heavy stuff on a on a uh, on a physical box in you know on a cloud server somewhere on a vm on your network to do all the you know bgp heavy lifting and things like that and then they just push it from there into whatever the switch supports I mean, it's kind of like the um the open flow model right where you've got a controller that's pushing out routing decisions to edge devices. It, I mean, uh, open flow in itself is a debate we could probably talk for hours on, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's SDN, uh, it's SDN design. Which it's, is uh, a can of worms. Just saying SDN because some people will uh, will think, oh well, that's uh, that's what I use to automatically bring up my IPsec tunnels on the edge of my network. To all of my things, right? So everybody's got kind of a, or I guess more people call that SD WAN, right? It uh, there's, I think there's SD, whatever you want it to be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, Kevin was saying that uh, that their dev team was claiming that they could load 30 million routes in 40 seconds into it seems like generic switches. Hmm. So that's interesting how how that happens. Um, does MPLS segment routing, whatever BGP LSVR is, I don't even know what that is, but apparently it does it. Um, so it sounds sounds like the new hot stuff if it actually does anything. You know, becomes shortest path routing extensions is what the LSVR is, whatever that is. Gotcha. I think um, Nick Baraglio was helping him out on that project, so I'm assuming once they get a little bit further down the road, Nick will have some updates on it. Oh, interesting. Okay. Our very own Nikki B. All right. You guys ready to move on? Because Carlin had some additional stuff, and I've seen he was talking about camouflaging his uh, like access points and his CPEs out at various areas. He's was talking about a really um, nice upscale area, and he's thinking about going where he's going to install, say, like a CPE, 
on a, on a structure, whether it's a house or like, I don't know, a condo or something like that. And just take a picture of that area and then going and having uh, like a vinyl wrap printed and then just wrapping all the CPE so they sort of disappear. And then maybe like his access points, making like a big 10 foot banner and wrapping it all the way around, I guess, like the, the sector. So they sort of disappear. And I know I've seen before where people will like disguise their access points and make them look like fake palm trees and stuff like that. But have you guys ever seen anybody vinyl wrap their antennas? Not I've that I know of. I've seen vinyl stickers with like you know company logos or, or like you know, for like CPE like you know right. property of whatever you know design stuff but like not not a wrap right not to make it sort of disappear blend into the background I think it's actually a pretty um, brilliant idea it sounds like a lot of work but uh, sounds cool it um, I have heard of you know painting it to blend um, but uh, Oh, I suppose uh, vinyl wrap allowed to be a little bit more complex as far as what it is versus just going to go buy a brown can of spray paint or whatever <laughs> might be close enough. Gotcha. I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe the area he's in is a little bit uh, more higher end, a little bit more pinkies up than we're accustomed to. A bit more sensitive to those things? Yeah, for sure. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do to get in the door, right? No. Yeah. I'd be curious to see how other people have camouflage equipment. Um, and you know, it's not like DirecTV's camouflaging their dishes or anything. Yeah, you know, big giant gray <laughs> monstrosities on the side of a building. So, you know, it is what it is. Let's see. Matt Whiteley was uh, so. I, my, let me reel back. Carlin was talking about YED. Uh, software for uh, graphing for building his diagrams of his networks and stuff and he was showing how you know you can have a bunch of different little pieces in there and then it's got some kind of auto spacing features in there so everything will just kind of magically space out really cool and then you can build a little bit more than have it space again space again um, which I think is pretty cool I've never tried really anything other than Visio uh, because I'm lazy and I, I know it and I can whip stuff up really fast and then Matt Whiteley was nice enough to send a Visio Cafe link which is just a bunch of free stencils to make your stuff look really pretty you know I've seen some people make some really pretty Visio diagrams that they present to customers and stuff like that and all of mine are very utilitarian very functional they are not um, aesthetically pleasing by any means but they are extremely functional so what do you guys generally do if you're gonna I think we've maybe covered this before but uh, it comes up enough to where I'd be curious to see what you guys use because I can't remember. I suck at documentation, so I just I usually don't do it. If I do anything, it's probably, once or twice a year I might draw something up in Visio, gotcha. but that's about it. Well, I think in pictures. So if I don't have a diagram, it's extremely hard for me to build stuff. That's just. I've about. personally been using Yap for years now. Okay. But not for like network diagrams, mostly for process diagrams or flow charts or gotcha. uh, logical diagrams. For network diagrams, I usually go to Visio as well. Gotcha. But you... like Via is amazing for complex charts. Very cool. Not for diagrams, at least not for me. You know, I heard somebody say about how expensive Visio was and it just wasn't manageable for them in their price range, which I think is interesting because. I purchased my copy of Visio, uh, the license anyway, off of eBay. Apparently, there's a system in the UK where you can reclaim licenses and it's legal, you know, if like the machine's being uh, destroyed or something like that. So you can get them for, I think I picked up my Visio license for like 30 bucks or something like that. So it's a pittance. So it's really accessible to anybody who thinks they can't afford Visio. If you want Visio, it's pretty darn cheap. Also, honestly, for anybody that's not doing this, there is Maps, Microsoft Action Pack, that gives you pretty much everything for like 500 bucks a year. And so, for anyone that's not doing Maps, just do yourself a favor and go and do Maps. You will get like 10 licenses of Windows 10, there is 5 licenses of Windows Server, there is licenses of Office and like everything else. Uh, yeah, all that you need to do, you need to register at Microsoft. There is uh, one 
like certification thing that you have to do. It's completely online. It will take you like two hours to click through it. And uh, yeah, you'll be saving like honestly thousands of dollars a year just by becoming or, or oh, subscribing yeah. for maps. Microsoft <laughs> actually. At, uh, at, uh, if you do anything with Azure, you get like a $100 per month Azure credit from maps and maps only cost like 500 bucks yeah. or something like that yeah cool. we so have, it's like uh, so just just that alone it's like each one of our companies even though we have like multiple dbas has a maps account so there's uh interesting ways of getting lots of licenses for those things let's see so moving on there's the ubiquity unify flex hd access point that just came out you guys see that thing i bet you looked at the link it looks like an alexa to me um, only much smaller, right? They, they put it next to in their, um, their graphics. They put it next to one of those little mini Coke cans, kind of the little skinny guys, the skinny boys. Oh, oh that's what that was. Yeah. It's, uh, I've been so busy. I haven't really like, like I've been catching up on the past week of slack during the cast. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's pretty, and, it's uh, pretty cute. It's got uh two by two, 2.4 gig radio. It's got a four by four, five gig radio. Wave 2 AC POE powered. It says indoor outdoor, which is interesting. Indoor out? Yeah. It's uh it's really cute. They got a desktop mount, wall mount, pole mount, a ceiling mount. Looks pretty neat. And uh, I think you can use it as a slides into their mesh system or whatever. So it can be a, a mesh AP. And then I was looking at their documentation, they have the Unified Dream Machine Pro. It's kind of hinted in there and I was like, what the heck is that? And that's like another Alexa looking dude, right? It's uh, kind of an all-in-one router oh. sort of thing, I think. Yeah, it, uh, it looks like they just took like one of their Switch chassis and... I don't know. I think I've posted like an FCC compliance thing for it. Well, the Dream Pro, I think, looks like but, uh, a coffee can. Uh, but like, you know, like a, a pretty sleek white one. Uh, yeah. That's got like a bunch of radios and some horsepower in there under the hood. So I think it's supposed to be kind of a like a home router slash Wi-Fi thing. I'm not sure if it actually acts as a router or if it's just a Wi-Fi access point. Um, but it's interesting. Another another Ubiquity product, you know, pop it out in a quarter. Really cute looking little guy. Yeah, it's a, I'm on the newsletter now watching their, you know, their animation. I see it. Yeah, all, outside all kinds of stuff. But what's interesting is that, like, they had it sitting on a table in the middle of a room. I'm like, so then how does it get power? <laughs> yeah. Let's see. If I click the buy it now button, they're saying they're about 180 bucks a piece. Which is not inexpensive. Yeah, that's, a, that's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> Compare that to yeah, the, uh, the, AC, uh, the AC light is what like 90 bucks 80 bucks something like that well i'm holding one of these monster audi audiences i got from uh isp supplies dish over there i still haven't opened the box mind you but um this guy retails for about 160 ish i think right in that same neighborhood and he's got a lot more kick than that though so it's uh just as a full aesthetic. feature micro tick do what now and it's a full featured micro. It is full feature set of router OS. And it's got uh, it's got the uh, I guess the additional five gigahertz radio made for uh, connecting to another one of these audiences or another device somewhere else to kind of bridge it into the network. So it's got more kick and more radios for a little bit less price. Although the, the I guess the Flex HD is smaller and cuter looking. It's... This audience it's is outdoor. a little bit bigger. Yeah, and the outdoor or the the audience is not outdoor. It's just an indoor AP, so it uh so no who who is the target customer for this? Because it's like they show it in all these like, you know, sexy type applications, but usually business doesn't you know, like it wants something reasonable, but you know, but then on the other side they have their Amplify, which is the supposed to be the you know f sexy, chic, you know in you know in home platform. Gotcha. Well, maybe so where the hell is um, it supposed to go? I don't know, man. Maybe this is uh, this is going to be targeted more at business as opposed to home users. Although 
I don't know, man. It it, it looks it, like it, from uh, the design, it looks like they would be targeting home users just as well. I mean, I guess the idea of it being kind of a uh, a meshing device, so you can throw it in there and it'll automatically mesh and pick up. So it would be really cute for a home user just to pay 180 bucks and drop one in somewhere and it'll magically connect back to the rest of their network. I guess that's um, that's kind of a, a sexy concept. It, it, uh, but if home's the target, then they the, you know they have Amplify, which is a home product and has meshing, and it's prettier. I don't know, man. This thing's pretty cool looking, I guess. But, uh, or, or is it Ubiquity ADD, where somebody else got an idea and it was just rushed through without thinking about, about how it would actually be used? <laughs> I have no they no would never do that at Ubiquity. <laughs> like this, like this stupid dream machine that can't, it's, it's, it's a great box. Except you can't adopt it to a regular Unify controller. Oh, interesting. It has to be self-contained. Interesting. It's like, well, because it's like, it, it it's a great Unify box. It has an access point and a switch and all kinds of stuff all in one little box. But you but you must use the integrated cloud, you know, uh, Unify controller. Can't use one of yours. Hmm. So like, it's like, well, it's... It's ubiquity for you. So it's like, well, what are you going to do with that? It's a standalone device there, huh? Oh, well. Let's, uh, let's all uh, mosey on over to Thomas's security corner, where perhaps we'll get a rant. You never know. So you've got a Cisco ASA denial of service that's new for us. Yeah, this one actually just recently pro got promoted to a uh, 9 out of 10 vulnerability. Yikes. Uh, yep, and basically it's a DOS, so it's a denial of service, but it's a remote, unauthenticated reload of ASA. Nice. So this affects all Cisco ASA, it affects a threat defense, firepower threat defense modules, anything uh, running ASA or threat defense code. Basically, just by seeing IKEA. Uh, so UDP 500 port open, I can reload the device continuously. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's a that's a problem. That, yeah, that, that's, that's a problem. That is a problem. And considering this takes like these devices take like what five minutes to start up at least. They take a hot minute. Yeah, and so I mean a single packet to to reload continuously, right? So you can just scan the internet for open, you know, IKEA, UDP 500, and uh, or just blindly fire packets, you know, one every five minutes to every IP, and then you'll find out which one stops res responding, and that's a Cisco ASA. <laughs> How fantastic. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, definitely, I will have a link to the... Cisco uh, knowledge board uh, article, check if your firmware is affected, and if so, upgrade your code. Gotcha. It, uh, on a tangent off of that, you mentioned about how it takes five minutes to to uh, reboot it. Uh, I was at a customer's house today, and uh, he's an IT consultant, you know, works for various companies. Um, he's got my internet and someone else's internet. As, as anybody running a business should. Uh, and uh, he was saying that, that uh, at his house, you know, my internet is known as the good internet, and then the other people is the bad internet, so that's kind of nice. <laughs> uh, but I digress. Um, he was working on a project that uh, was involving some Palo Alto firewalls, and he was commenting on, you know, he made some change and he had, and it, it needed to reboot, and it said it was going to take 45 seconds to reboot. It was more like 10 minutes. Damn. I was like, how how can a network appliance take 10 minutes? Because like, he's like, you know, once once it was, you thought it was done, because it was at a login screen, uh, in the GUI, it still wasn't ready because some other services weren't running yet, so you couldn't actually log in. Uh, if you're at the console, it was, you know, it gives you a login prompt and won't let you in. 
and then just sometime in the future, it now accepts your credentials. Gotcha. I have no experience with the Palo Altos, but did you say he was doing an upgrade to it? Um, I don't know what the projects are. I mean, like, uh, that he was doing, but he was saying that this was like normal behavior. Like sure. it would take so like, you know, five minutes plus. Gotcha. All right, then. Yeah. ASAs take a hot minute to reboot. I mean, there's, uh, there's so many things that I've, uh, you know, you're like a hundred miles from a device. You tell it to reload and then you ping dash T it. And then you just sit there and sweat when it feels like it's taking too long. You know, there's, yep. That's happened to me so many times at work. A chassis, and it always you know, feels longer oh when my you God. are just waiting for it and staring at the screen. Forever. Yeah, sometimes you just have to get up and walk away for a second and then come <laughs> Or uh, you, you haven't coffee. rebooted a chassis in three years and you're like, mm, I don't know about this. Let's see what happens. Ugh. Ugh. Let's see if we are paying all the soys today or not. <laughs> <laughs> Am I going to have a good day or a bad day? Here we go. Let's roll the dice, boys. Ah, uh, good times. <laughs> I too like to live dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I too like to it, live dangerous. It's uh, I guess, on a tangent of a tangent, because uh, we never go down that rabbit hole. Um, I was you know at that customer today. Um, saw pop up on his Slack, you know, from one of the companies. And he showed me. Apparently, somebody there got a tattoo, of, Project Breadwinner, and I'm like. What the heck is this? So, like, I look it up. Apparently, somebody has made a gaming toaster. Um, I don't quite know what it is. Uh, I, I see, like, toast that has, like, green lights on it. And, like, it's... So, or... this, uh, it was from Razer, a company that that's making like gaming peripherals, mm -hmm. uh, mice, keyboards, etc. And it was a April Fool's prank or, you know, publicity stunt for April 1st. It, uh, but like, somebody has gone and gotten a tattoo of it. Nice. I was like, what is going on? Um, but then I, I see a PC Gamer article from May 1st saying that this toaster is actually going to be a real thing. It was April Fool's joke. Now it's going to be a real thing. There you go. Uh, I was like, what in the... <laughs> I can make that happen. I, uh, I got... No, I mean, you've got to have your branded Razer branded <laughs> toast, right? For sure, man. Wouldn't be a complete Gamer breakfast without it. I, uh, in a million million years ago in a different life i made a, a mini itx pc into uh, a lincoln log cabin and i got in a newspaper it was pretty awesome <laughs> well, I'm look for this now greg yeah, so on the, the front page of the circuit section of the new york times <laughs> oh oh you made a real newspaper yeah yeah a real one that was uh that was a long time ago March 3rd, 2003. Yeah, I used to do a lot of modifications. I made um, uh, a tower and I covered it in AstroTurf. And it was like uh, golf themed, sort of. And I put a golf ball launcher in there. So you would like uh, load a bunch of balls in and they would like fire out. And then you could like uh, chip into the front of it and it would like, you know, get it and like shoot it back at you. It was like a little putting thing. I got into a European magazine. With <laughs> I used to do all kinds of dumb stuff. Oh, back when I was young and dumb and beautiful. I sort of had hair back then. Not really, though. Uh, let's see. So let's talk about the uh, Windows NTLM uh, domain takeover. What's the story on that, bruh? All right. So back to the security corner. Yeah, this one is nasty. So uh, Windows NTLM is a authentication protocol for Windows that's been deprecated and marked as, you know, obsolete years and years ago and uh, replaced by Kerberos. But surprise, surprise, in Windows 10 and Windows Server 16 and Windows Server 19, uh, it's still a thing. Hmm. So there is a NTLM authentication protocol vulnerability that allows the attacker to take over the entire domain. Interesting. And I'll just, I'll, I'll just give you a second to let that sink in because that 
is ridiculous. So simply by having communication to a domain controller, you can take over the entire Active Directory. Mm -hmm. How wonderful is that? Well, that's crazy because it's the article saying that um, Kerberos has been the preferred method since Windows 2000. <laughs> so I mean that's <laughs> that's a minute ago. But it's still, yeah, NTLM is still enabled by default, I guess. Yep. Oh, no. So, anybody that's running a Windows server and Active Directory, patch immediately. This should be, like, top priority number one immediate Holy cow. rectification. I'm, I'm, <laughs> like, I'm going to... To a couple of my domain controllers right now. Like, are you updated? I think so, one is because it just rebooted. I just had to log into it, so. Imagine how easy this is to exploit. How many kids across various schools will be able to, with a couple of clicks, take over the domain, right? The Active Directory. Imagine how many government organizations, how many businesses. Just this is ridiculous. Yeah, because... It's, it seems to me that, like, a significant amount of businesses, like, until you're at, like, a huge scale, like, the more sophisticated the business, the more likely you are to be disabling updates across your whole network because of, you know, not enough time to, you know test against all, you know, cases with your software. So I know some places just disable it. Which is how they get all these, you know, ransomwares and you know, various viruses and exploits and things because mm -hmm. they don't update anything. No, yeah, but so, it's, it's one thing to get, like, single PCs exploited, right? It's another thing to be able to take over the domain. The whole domain. I mean... Well, for sure, yeah. Yeah. And so, like, those same people, now it's like, oh, it was just your desktops. Well, I mean, now it's your domain. I mean, if you take over the domain, make yourself domain admin, and then, I mean, you could just exfiltrate absolutely everything, or you could just scrub the entire domain. I mean, you could do anything you wanted. Yeah, deploy ransomware through GPOs across the network. Sure, exfiltrate all their information, sell it to China, and then ransomware their machines. Why not do best of both worlds? Says, so yeah, this is ridiculous. This should be priority number one to patch and fix and, and immediately remediate against. This is serious. Yeah, it says even though NTLM Relay is an old technique, enterprises cannot completely eliminate the use of, proto of the protocol as it will break many applications. That's awesome. I guess that's like how in the U.S. <laughs> uh... we, uh, what was it, like uh, the metric system became... Like our standard unit of measurement, but nobody was forced to actually move off of Imperial, so we're all still on Imperial. I guess it's one of those sort of things. <laughs> yet, uh, I had uh, at uh, one of my previous clients, uh, one of their vendors' application uh, required that, that the user be uh, in an admin on the machine for the program to to run um because it stored things in like the you know root c folder and like you can't give permissions in any way to that other than being full admin and it's just like there's a holdover from 20 years ago when that wasn't even a consideration and it's like how do how do these companies just not upgrade Pet. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I don't want to spend any more money on broke. this, so we're going to keep using <laughs> the same old thing. I've heard it plenty of times. And everybody's got something old out there that they're still supporting, whether they want to or not, for one reason or another. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, I'm logged into a server 2003 box right now. Hmm. <laughs> for some... Granted, I've only been in charge for, for about a year and a half, uh, two years, and I've been busy with other stuff, but yeah. Good luck getting patches for that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like, what can we do here? What's available there? Mm -hmm. 
All right. Well, I had kind of an open-ended thought uh, that I was just curious to see where you guys would go with this. <clears throat> we were doing this exercise uh, at the day job the other day, and I got on the idea of automation thinking or kind of efficiency thinking, right? So the idea being, um, this is sort of the birth of it. The idea was, um, is there a way that we can look at the normal processes and procedures we generally follow for different things and then think of them from kind of an automation perspective and actually streamline it as much as possible? And, and this goes beyond just uh, network automation or server automation. Case in point, we were talking about, say, uh, we get a call for hands and eyes at a data center, which is really common, right? So somebody will say, hey, um, call me, go in front of my rack and call me. I'm going to walk you through some stuff, right? So whatever it might be, it might be moving a cable from point A to point B. It might be looking at a server. It might be uh, somebody's like lost access to a server or they think a drive's failed or something like that, and they just need eyes on it, right? So generally what we do is we go up there and we play a game of telephone where we look at it, we you know just relay information back and forth, and we're just talking about it. So the idea being, what if you could put like a GoPro on the tech's chest as they stand in front of the cabinet, and that would stream straight back to the customer, right? So they actually see exactly what you're seeing. They can walk you through as you're moving your hands. You know, so it, to me, that's like um, that's maybe cutting down a 15 minute interaction down to say a minute or two minutes, right? It's kind of that automation efficiency thinking how can i streamline this procedure right and that's that's a human physical interaction that's not um, something in a server or something on a piece of equipment so i thought that was really interesting but how do you come up with those ideas i found that if i was already able to come up with these ideas i would have right so it's like uh, it's just like you know um how <laughs> oh man i almost went some crazy place uh, with a really funny joke that I would have to edit out, so I'm not going to say that. Uh, but, you know, if, if, you know, why is it that before I go to bed every night I have to, you know, turn the light switch off and on it three times in every room? Um, you know, if, if I had somebody come in from the outside and look at that and say, you know what, maybe you need some, uh, some mental help and you won't have to do that, right? But so the idea I came up with was kind of like a, um, an efficiency czar or an automation czar, somebody that would come in from the outside, maybe they wouldn't even have to be super technical, but just look at things you do on a normal basis and you know, say, well, maybe you could do this, maybe you could do that. Um, this was sort of born from the idea of, uh, what do you call it, rubber ducky debugging, right? Where maybe you just talk to somebody who's not technical and you walk them through a process you're about to do. You know, like I'm walking through, this is how I think I should do this thing. And uh, sometimes they can give you insights uh, that you would have never expected. Like, um, I've come up with some really convoluted ways of accomplishing a task. And when I told it to just a lay person, they were like, well, why don't you just do this simple thing? And the answer is because I wouldn't get to do all these complicated things. And that would be so much simpler and more reliable. Of course, why would I do it that way? You know, and so there's just something about that. Um, having an outside perspective look in at things that I think it can be so invaluable and kind of automation thinking. I was just curious if you guys do things, right? So like in the digital world, if you do something more than like five times, you could probably automate it, right? If it's the exact same menial task over and over, is there something in your physical life and your physical interaction, your physical business things that you think that maybe you could automate? I was just curious if, have you actually looked at that sort of thing? Not necessarily digitally automate it, you know, but like streamline it. Have you ever, have you ever guys, have you ever really kind of contemplated that sort of thing? Well, I mean, at a real basic level, it's like, you know, when somebody wants to go to this grocery store today, and then that grocery store tomorrow, and then this other store, they like, want you just go to the mall right now and be done with it. Or like, um, it seems like you're hitting at something stranger specific there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do know multiple people with that issue. Yeah, so. yeah. Or, or it could be like uh, your support calls. Have you guys ever looked at the support calls you're taking in and seen commonalities in there and then maybe ways you could, you know, either speed up mean time to repair on that stuff or um, 
you know, maybe uh, come up with a method to avoid getting those calls altogether. So in Unimus, for example, we do that all of the time, right? Like any functionality or feature in Unimus, any checkbox should be self-explanatory. And if it's not, there should be a question mark or a context help that prevents somebody from either either having to go and Google something or yeah, create the support ticket or, you know, ask things. It's like on that level, you know, speaking from a software development world, uh, they try to engineer the user experience around avoiding issues like that. Uh, but yeah, that's just the software world, right? In, in the real physical world, <laughs> It's much complicated. Well, I mean, in your in your Unimus world, I, I see the same thing, right? Um, uh, Unimus going out to devices, say just one aspect of it is going out and backing up devices. You know, if, if you had to manually do that, that would be ridiculous, right? And then um, say also the diffing mechanism, right? Where it'll take multiple backups and you can compare what's changed, right? That's a, that's a physical thing that is a pain in the butt to have to do. And if it was a manual process people would probably be less inclined to use it. And now you've automated it and it's super simple, right? And so it's just, you just keep iterating on what's a manual process people are using uh, or, or what's something manual they have to do in this and how do we automate that, right? So it's, I mean, it seems very logical to me in software. It's just, it's funny how in our real life, we don't always think about those sort of things. You know, like how, uh, what is it? Like FedEx or UPS decided, you know, that, they will calculate routes based on left turns so the drivers can take or rather right turns so they can take as many right turns as possible because they're probably not going to have to sit at a stoplight and wait for that left turn if they just take a right turn and so it's it's interesting solutions to common problems that we're probably uh nose blind to you know like when your gym socks stink really bad and they're sitting next to you for an hour you don't smell them anymore they kind of go away right and i think we just get callous to those common tasks we have to do all the time, right? The keeping the lights on stuff, uh, the human interaction piece. Uh, maybe it's that I just am super antisocial and I don't want to deal with humans anymore. Uh, but it could just be that I'm trying to be efficient. Take your pick which one it is. Oh, it's like, you know, getting out of the, out of the habitual stuff is, is important. You have to, yeah, you just have to, instead of being on autopilot, you have to think about what you are doing and like constant optimization and constant avoidance of bottlenecks is is really important. Yeah. So what I've decided to do is take somebody who's clever. They don't necessarily have to be technically inclined. They don't necessarily have to be in the same industry. I think it can, can help. I think it can actually help, though. But take somebody who's clever, who likes to problem solve and troubleshoot and... Just have them uh, follow along for an hour and see what happens or, or, you know, look at some common things we do and just have them. So probably in the next week or two, I'm going to give it a go uh, by bringing in kind of an outside guy and just letting him see what we do. The, the understanding is they'll do it for us and then we'll do it for them, right? So we'll kind of trade uh, annoyances there. Uh, but just to see if maybe bringing in an outside perspective actually can make a difference. And I think, I think it will. I'm just curious if anybody else has, has thought about doing something like that or, or attempted it on kind of the human level. I mean, you could still use a technological solution to a human problem. I'm just curious if, if people have sort of, well, I mean, you know, a factory. <laughs> yeah, just replace all the humans. Yeah, right? with robots. Yeah, as soon as Ziga is like... <laughs> That kind of killed the automotive industry, didn't <laughs> all of the workers there? But uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. I think <laughs> you know, automation thinking is what I'm going to try and do. And it's it's it's. I guess it's also efficiency. Like if you ever read the book uh, Cheaper by the Dozen, the parents in that book were efficiency experts. So they'd go into like a factory and they'd basically say, "Bring me the laziest guy you got, you know, that you haven't fired because he actually gets his job done." And they would study what he does. You know, because that guy is going to find the fewest number of movements required to accomplish the task, right? And get it done as efficiently as possible. And then they would uh, replicate what he was doing for other people in similar positions throughout the factory. And I just thought, well, that's brilliant. Why don't 
people do more of that kind of thing um, in their day to day, you know, because I guess probably most of the people listening here aren't in giant Fortune 500 companies, you know, or Fortune 100 companies where they're just a tiny little cog in a big giant machine. They're probably, you know, in smaller companies where making a minor shift like this could result in in a big efficiency gain for them as a whole. So I was just curious if people actually stop and think about that stuff or are you so mired down in just keeping the lights on and putting out fires that you don't actually get an opportunity to think about that kind of stuff. So maybe having somebody pop in from the outside would be beneficial. Just curious. Mm-hmm. It, it, you know, it, it, uh, sounds like something that, uh, we should do. Um, I I'm too busy trying to fix the, the technical issues. You're so busy keeping the lights on. Yeah. It, uh, and reading about uh, your log cabin PC, <laughs> and uh, I think I've got another one I've, on miniitx.com. There's like yep, uh, I made one for yep, my aunt Hager uh, one time. Yep, yep. I was I was looking at that one too. <laughs> it's a little wooden box thing. That's interesting. Yeah, with a, it, with uh, a big giant CD-ROM drive. It. <laughs> uh, good it. Um, it uh, I was. I didn't know anybody that had ever actually bought a uh, VSC3 processor-based system, but that's what your log cabin was. But yeah, I think I bought one of those, and then Mini ITX gave me a couple more to build projects with. The the Mini ITX peeps. So there you go. Uh, I used to do a lot of dumb stuff back in the day. So Mikey Wispapalooza is upon us. You're excited. You're hyped. You're tingling with anticipation. Yes, yes uh, and that's that's a good thing to be tingling with when talking about Vegas. <laughs> uh, um, actually, uh, I fly out or I leave home in less than twelve hours uh, for the airport, and, uh, and actually, Kate's going to join me midweek. Um, so that'll be uh, be fun. Um, we've got, uh, we got, uh, Tommy man in the cameras yeah. or camera. Yeah. T-Cent's going to be out there. You're going to be out there. I think JJ and Kim are going to be there this year. I'm not a hundred percent on that. So look for them. Yeah, uh, sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and like, I've, uh, like I'm so far behind. I'm like, what's going on there? Because like, I haven't. I've been so busy with stuff. It's like I, I'm going. I haven't really like I've booked myself for two vendor, like, events, but I haven't really done anything else. Um, so probably a poor representation of uh, of a Wisp America or Wisp Wisp Palooza attendee. Um, I know we shared a couple articles on social media, uh, Facebook and Twitter, that uh, Visp had had uh made some blog posts last year about you know maximizing your your uh experience of the show so i saw there's a new wisp of palooza app that people are saying it's got a lot of good info on it right yet um yeah i stopped using the groupio app that they had before because it was just a pile of crap it would just randomly close it wouldn't save it wouldn't search it would just randomly not function at a basic level gotcha. so i just stopped trying i think uh so of uh, fun stuff to go check out i think i think isp supplies is doing a buy sells thing like you know like an after hours thing who else is doing an after okay. hours thing um i know uh sonar uh cambium um is mimosa doing one this year i don't i don't know um I don't think my Mosa is doing much since they have been bought or sold. Hmm. It, it, um, I, I can't say what I know, but I know they're not down and out. Okay. Well, I'm just trying to, anybody who happens to listen to this tomorrow and needs to sign up for an event, it would be, you said Sonar, Cambium, and then maybe buy sales with ISP supplies. You can drop by and see those guys about their after-hour stuff. 
Uh, I don't remember anybody else that's doing anything. I haven't been watching it super close because I'm not going, but there you go. It, it, uh, yeah, and, but like, I keep, I keep trying to get the vendors to tell us ahead of times so that we can make a Google Calendar and put all of their stuff on there because people are like, oh, I signed up for such and such event, but I didn't know that XYZ event was happening at the same time. Now I don't know which one to go to. And, and, but you know, I've got friends that are going to this one, but I, it's like, I wish they would just tell me all this stuff like two months in advance. I just make a calendar and let people just figure out what they want to do. That would be no fun. Where's your sense of adventure, Mike? But, uh, my sense of adventure is nowhere. Um, because I have too much shit to do. Yeah, me too. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, We're at an hour and a half. Do you have any final important thoughts? No. Did you have any before we started? Didn't think so. Mm, no. <laughs> All right, let's take a fork in it. Mikey, if people want to get a hold of you, hey, maybe next week, where would they do yeah. that? It, uh, here's an opportunity for me to say something different than leave me alone. <laughs> um, next week, I will be in Las Vegas for Wispapalooza 2019 at the Rio Hotel and Casino, the last year at that venue. Yeah, nice. So go out there, find Mikey, shake his hand, kick him in the junk, whichever you prefer. He's open to any, 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 uh, anything. He's equal opportunity. And... He's got the tingling, so you know. He's, he's... <laughs> That's he's right. ready for it. He's got the fever and he's more cowbell. Uh, Thomas, if people want to get a hold of you, how do they go about doing that? So sadly, not at this Papalooza this year due to just absolute lack of time. Next year, I promise. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm, as usual, just Google for me. I'm very easy to find. I'm the easiest is unimus.net. Just go there. We have live chat if you need me. Ask for me. I'll be there. Excellent, excellent. Maybe next year, if you're too busy, you can have a surrogate go out there and do it for you. That way, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, we are actually on the busy front. We are actually hiring three people right now. One of those will be meant to to be a dedicated sales guy that go to conferences and stuff like that. So, yeah, next year will be better. Baller, man. Love those Slovakians, even though I only know one of them. Uh, let's see. If you want to get a hold of me, Greg at GregSoul.com. I occasionally blog at GregSoul.com. If you want to really get a hold of me, the easiest way is to go to Patreon.com forward slash The Brothers Wiss. Throw us some love there. Jump on the Slack. Throw a DM. I tell you what, dude. When people ask questions in the Slack or have comments of some sort, I would say within probably five minutes, somebody's got an answer, a solution, or a... Um, meaningful gif that will not help you in any way shape or form <laughs> case in point uh the other day uh one of my guys threw a loop in the the little local network there it didn't actually affect anything it just brought the switch down because uh, he was building up a device and somehow bridged it into the wi-fi and then background anyway he sent me a picture of this big fat cat staring at a bowl of uh fruit loops and it said brother may i have some loops and uh I've got to use that a couple of times now. So it's the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, well, we're going back to hieroglyphics, right? With the memes and stuff. So uh, I love it. Anyway, thank you. It's, uh, it's uh, end cats. Yeah, for sure. Questions, comments, let us know. Jump on the Slack. Uh, again, I love it when you guys are uh, animated in there or even you lurkers, kind of like me. I appreciate everybody that's in there. Everybody's got something to offer, something to give. Go and see everybody at... Wispapalooza, say hi to him, buy Mikey a beer, give him an SFP, he loves those things. And uh, I guess until next time, we'll see you guys. And before see we you. finish, oh. it's called the GIF, not the GIF. Oh, the uh, developer so said, choose the admin, choose GIF. So, uh, I'm pretty sure it's GIF. It's okay. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.